The substance that I'm going to share with you has been uh, uh, percolating in my heart for several years now. Um, it just never was the quiet time for me to kind of pull the trigger on readjusting my priorities and my focus. Um, but it's not just me. Then there's also been hours uh, spent with the staff, not just in discussions, but in taking time to uh, pray, to seek the Lord, to seek our hearts, to be discerning about where God is taking us. I, I don't, I, I think that it, it would be silly for us not to acknowledge that our community has certainly gone through some shifts uh, over the past few years. Undoubtedly, that was accelerated by the pandemic. Every church in America is experiencing that and trying to discern now what it means for ministry in the post-pandemic world and that some of the changes that we all thought were going to be temporary, we are learning those changes aren't temporary. It, it altered trends in American life. It altered our approach to the way we shop, the way we work. It, it altered, it changed things, and those changes aren't going to shift back to normal. These are, they're permanent. And, and, and as a society, we'll keep building on them. And so, so there's been even a shift as contemporary Americans that we've experienced. Um, but but this, this has been some time that has been spent in prayer and really seeking what is God calling us to in the new season or cycle of our church life. And as I said, it's not just me. I've spent lots of time with the staff. Of course, we've shared this with the elders as well. And I want to share it with you. It seems that now... In the post-pandemic world is a great time to reevaluate who we are, what we're being called to do. And so I want to share with you the renewed vision and mission statement and the way we're going to communicate and organize our community in this next season. And so I'm going to start with uh, looking at Ephesians chapter 3, uh, verses 16 and 19. Um, this has been a long-term, uh, this has been a verse that has long-term meaning for me personally and um, challenged me and encouraged me and invited me uh, into a deeper priority of positioning myself and organizing my lifestyle around deepening my formation into Christ. But I did not bring this up initially at the staff meeting. We actually, it was over a year ago, we went to a staff retreat. One of the other staff members shared this verse and and, and as that happened, and it wasn't, a, it was a treat, we, a retreat. We weren't just gathering and discussing. We, 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 we actually got away from the church for a day. Uh, we went on some personal walks, prayer walks, um, had some challenges to really ask some questions of the Lord, did a check-in with our own hearts, and then it did a check-in with what we all feel we're being called to produce and to do with our vocations and with our work. And as, as one of the members read this verse, it, 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 it was just a really special moment. And you probably have experienced those special moments where it just, the room felt like the favor of God. It felt like the endorsement of God. It, it, it moved all of our hearts and, and, op and, and created space for a, a deeper conversation. And so I want to begin with that because it really, it, it really began to take shape in my mind it was kind of the missing piece because it's so beautifully articulated from the scripture, the, the vision and the passion that was growing in my heart. So, so let's take a look at this. And obviously, I've made some emphasis in the verse. You'll see those in the notes and probably on the overhead as well. But let's look at Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. I pray that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you being rooted and firmly established in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and the width and the height and the depth of God's love. And to know Christ's love 
that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now let's look at those passages here. Let's go ahead and keep them on the overhead for just a few more minutes and let's let it linger here. What Paul is saying in that last sentence is his goal is for the Ephesian believers to have an experience. That experience he describes as being filled with all the fullness of God. And look at the path that he lays out for how that happens. It happens when we experience being rooted and firmly established in love. It happens whenever we begin to comprehend the length, width, height, and depth of God's love. It happens when we begin to experience and know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge. From this verse, we can see that one of the first callings, obligations of those who are following Christ is that you learn to establish your self-concept, your identity as who you are in Christ. That only happens as you give yourself over to being willing to first and foremost be loved by God. In fact, Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. And one of the things we under communicate when we talk about mission and service is that the only way to do service in the name of Jesus is if you first allow God to serve you. The, the, the only way you become a healthy person through whom the gospel can be displayed is by your own willingness to rest in God's absolute love for you. And if we miss that on a personal or communal level, then it doesn't matter how sophisticated we can articulate our doctrines and beliefs. Because in the end, Christianity is not a cerebral faith. It is a living faith that flows from the heart. I'm not saying it's anti-intellectual. It is most certainly shaped by thinking. And there is a place for that. But we have to remember to be a Christian, to be awake, is to be awakened to the fact that God has set his love on you and that changes everything you're willing to believe about yourself. And it's, it's a process. And, and I don't want to slip from sermon to rant unless it's ordained by the Spirit. <laughs> but it's interesting to me. I, I have tried to be vocal. The man that I am today is not the man that the church hired eight years ago. And one of the significant reasons for that is that I had the broad idea that we would go through the gospel of Luke. And when I did, I ran into a Jesus that seemed like a stranger to me. Because that Jesus revealed in that gospel looked so different than the one I created in my mind with all the trappings of contemporary religious subculture. And I knew in that moment that God was asking me to make a choice and that that choice was going to result in joy and pain because it would come at a cost. But I could not unsee the beauty of the Savior that we meditated upon for three years. It it, it began to alter my, it required me to make my theology submit to the Lordship of Christ rather than the reverse, which is how I had been living my life for decades. And I also became awake and I started a process of liberation that continues to this day and continues moving in the right direction. And as you know, one of the things I was impacted on uh, by was Jesus teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, the fuller version of it is found in Matthew. So it led me back to Matthew. Where, Where is that exactly? Oh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. That's right. That's where it is. Now, now please don't, 
Feel free to ask me questions if in my poor communication I create space for misinterpretation. But when you read the Sermon on the Mount, it, it is Jesus' vision for what his followers would do. It, it, it is a description of what the lifestyle of the kingdom, the lifestyle of following Jesus, or even more extensively, the lifestyle of recognizing the Christ in you. When that happens, this is the fruit that it look. This is the fruit that is born. This is what it looks like. So a few hundred years later, when the church began growing, and we got state recognition, things began to change. And and one of the things that needed to happen was to address some of the abusive, toss, toxic. Um, ideas about Jesus that were floating around in that time. And so there were a lot of hard fought battles and there were lots of discussions and debates and, and, and the history of the development of Christian doctrine is something that I think every follower of Jesus should at some level become aware of because it, it is not as romantic as we all think that it is. But when they pr began to produce unifying documents, they came in the fort of creeds. And I love the creeds. I, I still appreciate Rich Mullins. Um, what, what, what does he say? It's, it, it's, 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 it's the belief that's changing me when he, when, when he sings his creed song. I, I follow a liturgy. And oftentimes in that liturgy, it begins with a, re repeating the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. But if you take those creeds and set them next to Matthew 5, 6, and 7, here's what you're going to notice glaringly. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is very little about what you're required to believe. It's a description of what you're called to do. And if you look at the creed, it is exclusively statements about what you're obligated to believe. There is nothing in it about what you're supposed to do. We all as individuals need to go on a journey and sort out what that might mean for us. For me, it doesn't mean jettison the creeds. That is not what I'm saying. But it is very important that those creedal belief statements are there to serve and empower me to do what Jesus has called his community to do and to live the life he's invited us to live. And we recognize here that begins with learning how to let Jesus love us, to let God love us, and in keeping with the biblical, the biblical metaphor, to let love love us. We have to be rooted in the love of God or we will take the gospel message, but it will be channeled through a very broken, toxic ideology. And then it does damage. It gets contaminated. One of the other translations that we were all moved by, and it's somewhat of a, of a paraphrase translation, but it's the Passion Translation. And I just want to read to you Ephesians 3.17. I changed the, the, is it, oh, yes, thank you guys. I didn't know if that would be in there or not. Ephesians 3.17 in the Passion Translation says it very clearly. Then by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside you. And the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. I love that translation. And for me personally, this is what I want to do with the rest of my years on earth. That's what I want to be pursuing. So with this revelation of the priority of Jesus revealing the Father so that we could know the love of God, this is the vision statement on the heart of, of myself, the staff, the leadership. Our vision statement is this. Our vision is to be a community so rooted in God's love that we are renewing the understanding and expression of Christianity in our generation. We are not proposing we're doing anything new. In fact, if you'll notice, a lot of the changes we make are just changes to get back to ancient ways of doing things. Regular communion uh, is an example. 
opening ourselves up to the great tradition of liturgical prayer practices that have been passed down or spiritual formation practices. So I am not saying we're doing anything new, but what we are, but we are, what I'm recognizing is every generation has a call to steward the mission to their generation. We are no different. We are a community of followers of Jesus that there are a lot of personal uh, relational benefits we get from being part of a community organization, but we must never forget that this organization doesn't exist for ourselves alone. We are called to steward the mission to our generation. We are called to be open to the places of darkness that exist within our generation and be willing as the spirit leads to go shine the light of the gospel in those places. And so the way we are owning that mission and that call for us isn't that we're doing anything new from the ancient priorities of faith. In fact, I think if there's any repentance, it's to go back to a radical focus on being formed in the image of Christ. And, and so as that happens, I do believe that there are those who've experienced an, inocul an inoculation to the gospel because they experienced maybe a toxic version of it and they've come to believe that there is no hope for them in the gospel of Jesus. But it's possible that what they experienced was tainted by man-centered thinking and that they need to be shown that the church doesn't always equal Jesus in its organized structure. That leads me to my second point before we go through the mission statement. What I am talking about here, it's important to remember that a healthy vine requires two things, a vine and a trellis. The point of the vineyard is not the trellis. The point of the vineyard is a healthy vine that produces fruit. And as that vine grows and changes, it might need a trellis upgrade. I have an enormously open mind about what we might need to do when we're having a trellis conversation about our organization. But I have a very narrow mind when we talk about defining what the vine is. And so what I am talking about this morning is not structural or organizational. I am not talking about the trellis. I am talking about the vision of the vine that we are seeking to cultivate here at Christ Community Church. And so with that said, once again, our vision is to be a community so rooted in God's love that we are renewing the understanding and expression of Christianity in our generation. The mission, what we're called to do based on the hope that we will work towards seeing this vision come to fruition is this, our mission at Christ Community Church is to equip people to be true to Christ, to be kind to all people, and to be the body of Christ in our community and beyond. To be true to Christ, to be kind to all people, and to be the body of Christ in our community and beyond. Now, one of the sources of inspiration is found in one of the Old Testament prophets. But it's an inspiration, not just because it's, it's, I mean, lots of people are inspired by this verse, but in this verse, you also see what Jesus embodied while he was here on earth. If you look at this verse and you go back and read the gospels and see what Jesus was about and what he did and the attitude and the way in which he did it, he embodied this verse. And so this verse has also been very informative for us in understanding the strategy for what our community ought to be doing. And so that verse is uh, Micah 6, 8. And what I hope you see, there is a coordination, that there is a, there's, there's a correlation in the three statements of our mission statement, the three imperatives of Micah 6, 8, and in the three ways we've articulated our community values of community, communion, and compassion. Micah 6, 8 says this, He has told you, mortal one, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, 
to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. Look at the imperatives. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. I don't talk like this a whole lot because I grew up in church cultures where ministers talked like this anytime they had a microphone in their hands. And after a while, it just kind of became part of the culture. But in my heart, I believe that we are ripe for a Jesus-centered revival in our generation, not just in our country, in our generation. I, I really, really believe that. I mean, I, I'm not a t I get it, I'm not a typical preacher man. I, I don't know about end of the world stuff. And I mean, I was on a Zoom call this week where three very brilliant minds were talking about that and they came to my opinion. I'm just like, I've got nothing. That's not a thing that motivates me or energizes me. But what does motivate and energize me is the power that happens when someone goes either from being a completely non-believer to encountering the living Christ, or if a numb, dead, bored, apathetic believer encounters the living Christ. The results are the same in either, category, in either situation regardless of their belief systems. And I do believe the living Christ transforms our lives. I do believe the living Christ, as we follow and yield to him, he makes us more godlike than we would be if we weren't following after him. And so Micah 6, 8 is a great way to present a well-rounded vision of that. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly. So what might it look like for us to, uh, what would it look, oh, sorry, Siri interrupted me. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, what does it look like to participate in our mission? What, what does this mean for you? Well, first of all, it means that we embrace the call to be true to Christ. This is what our value of communion is all about. It's not just that we value the act of the um, ordinance or ritual of communion, although that is part of it, not because in and of itself, but what it is pointing to. And, and so, uh, but we're talking about something more than what we might call the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist. We're talking about a life of deep communion with God in which we learn to be true to Christ. How? By trusting him as savior, knowing him as friend, and obeying him as Lord. And although it's one, two, three, that is not a hierarchy of, hierarchy of priority, that is just for organizational sake. I probably should have done bullet points rather than numbers because so, the numbers can miscommunicate. But to trust him as Savior, to know him as friend, and to obey him as Lord. Because I do think that, which would be a fascinating discussion for you to have with your friends or with your partner, um, that there are seasons in which we can see that there are some spiritualities that emphasize him as Savior, but don't necessarily emphasize the ongoing daily friendship and what it means to submit to him as Lord. There are, there are spiritualities that really love the touchy-feely, God's my friend part, but they don't really want to talk about the negative need of a savior to rescue them from their sins, and nor do they want the intimacy of friendship to be crowded out by the formality of the fact that Jesus is still their king. He's their Lord. And then there are those, and I've been part of them, that emphasize obeying Jesus as Lord, and they may mention Savior, but it's just as a gateway to really emphasize Lord. They don't talk a lot about friendship, and they do have something to say about our need to sub actually submit our wills to Jesus, but if there is not an awakening to spiritual intimacy, that turns into behavior modification and legalism. And it doesn't change us, it just teaches us to pretend whenever, whenever we're at church. And so I think a healthier balanced approach is to recognize that I should know Jesus 
in that I trust him as my Lord, I, 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 um, I um, know him as my friend, um, that I trust him as my savior, know him as my friend, and that I obey him as my Lord. Second statement in our mission, to be kind to all people. This is our value of community, and it corresponds to the call of the prophet to love kindness. Kindness isn't loved in our generation. And if it is loved, it's only loved via t-shirts and virtue signaling on Facebook. It's not necessarily loved in the way we choose to live our lives. And part of the Jesus-centered revival is gonna be a rediscovery of the power of the Spirit's fruit of kindness that gets manifested in the lives of those who are keeping in step with the Spirit. And it is very interesting in this discussion how kindness almost has a negative connotation. And I have been rebuked by friends both on the right and the left because they devalue kindness because they interpret that as not being willing to speak and stand up for truth. Or they interpret that as not being willing to acknowledge that there are some behaviors and beliefs that are toxic and harmful. But that is not what I mean. What I am troubled by is the number of people that believe that it's, it's not possible to speak the truth and ta- challenge ta- toxic behavior while being kind. It, it's this assumption that kindness has to go if we're going to value speaking the truth and addressing toxic behavior. Like we've got to be mean and, you know, threatening and It is the spirit that convicts of sin. It is before their Lord, whether your brother or sister stands or falls. That is not our calling and our job. In fact, kindness will actually make challenging deception and toxicity effective because it can be done in an atmosphere in which the recipients understand that they are loved. They're not getting kicked out. They're not being rejected. You are here to journey with the rest of us broken people as we continue our path to wholeness by learning how to consistently live as primarily the beloved of God as our core identity. So so that's why kindness has to lead. We have to remember, what what did Paul say about our God? It is his kindness that leads you to repentance. If that is how God operates, why do we think it has to be harshness and judgment in order to motivate to repentance? It is the kindness of God, and it is that same kindness of God as it bears fruit in our life, not as a behavioral strategy, how to win friends and influence people, be nice and remember their names and smile. That's not what I'm talking about. I am talking about the rugged fruit of kindness that will cost you dearly if you choose to allow it to be cultivated in your soul. Kindness, I assure you, does not regularly get pats on the back. It is typically offensive to anyone who is angry and committed to defending their ideology. Whether that's left-leaning or right-leaning, doesn't matter. But kindness can change the world. Kindness is the means that God uses to bring his wayward creation back to repentance. I don't think we can improve upon his strategy. So let's cease pretending that we can and instead yield to it, give ourselves to it. Uh, Where are we here? Oh, yeah. Um, So be kind to all people, love kindness. How do we do this? We want to extend grace. We want to refuse judgment. Now again, give me just a minute or two. I see three of you vigorously writing an email already. Number one, let's just get one thing really crystal clear. The sentiment, do not judge, lest you be judged, did not originate with me. I didn't come up with that. Jesus did, and I understand that it's a challenging sentiment, 
But it's not one we should challenge one another on. Get on your knees, get before your Lord and say, Jesus, what's up? I think you made a mistake. If that's how you feel about it, then that's, you should, he, he's kind enough to walk with you through that process. You can say those kinds of things to him, but I will give this one point of clarification. I don't mean that to refuse judgment means to refuse discernment. That would be highly irresponsible, not just to the individual, but I'm not talking about not making a judgment to where you don't challenge toxic behavior within a community. Because if that goes unchallenged, it will become like a cancer to that community. I have no qualms about under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, directly challenging toxic ideology and toxic behaviors because it's good for the person and it's good for the community. So I am not talking about that there's not a place to have discernment over various ethical choices. But what I am saying is, while I do that, here's the thing about the splinter and the beam. Do you remember the analogy? I think it came right after the whole don't judge. You know, don't worry about the splinter in your neighbor's eye when you've got a beam in yours. But here's the thing. Both the splinter and the beam are made of the same substance. So it is in recognizing that anytime I am challenging toxic ideology or behavior, I am challenging a temptation that exists in my own heart. I, I am not any better than the person whom I'm addressing. What is better about my position is that the living Christ is walking with me to remove both the beam and the splinter. And so, and so, and so this, this, this doesn't mean live a non-discerning life where we don't stand for anything of value, but it does mean the way we carry ourselves when we do that, we are willing to love and hug and serve our ideological enemies, even though we can't say we are in agreement with your ideology. We can still do that without slipping to war metaphor and culture wars and understand we are called to serve. And we can remember that that night that Jesus took the basin and the towel, he was serving a doubter, a denier, and a betrayer, and he gave them the same level of service and love. And so we want to embody that. Extend grace, refuse judgment, and serve joyfully. I've said it before, in times past, my involvement in this church, which I had just turned 50 last week, and I started attending at about 16 years of age. I think it's fine for a church to be known for what they believe. I think it's important that beliefs and values are communicated. But wouldn't it be nice for a church in the community to not simply and primarily be known by what they believe, but by what they do, by the way they bless the community, by the way they serve the community. I feel like that we can all have a level of virtuous pride in that being our reputation. And that comes from following the Savior in serving the broken in the way he has continued to serve the broken for the past 2,000 years via his body. So to extend grace, to refuse judgment, and to serve joyfully. And finally, the third statement, be the body of Christ in our community and beyond. This corresponds to our value of compassion, and it corresponds to the call to do justice. Because when we say justice, we are not talking about a contemporary, contemporary American political conversation. That's not what we're talking about. We are talking about biblical justice that reveals that God's heart is to work for the equity of all people, the fairness of all people. That revelation of God flows all the way through the narrative of the scripture in pretty radical ways that we won't get into because they get a little personal. That's for another sermon. But we recognize that doing justice from the Bible means living a life of honest compassion. It means being willing to, to, to be the body of Christ in the point of need. And so there is a strategy, if one is given in the Bible, 
Uh, someone said that the Sermon on the Mount was Jesus' mission statement, and then, then you get his um, strategic growth strategy in the book of Acts, which is what, do you remember what his strategic growth strategy was? Preach this gospel where? Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Well, I think that's a pretty good strategy. What might that mean for our story? Be the body of Christ in our community and beyond means we begin in Jerusalem. And what I mean by that is we begin with our personal relational sphere of influence. It is a return to recognize that what I do on the streets and what I do on the stage or behind the lectern or the pulpit matters little if Christ isn't seen in my home and within the relationships that are closest to me, which frankly are, is the hardest place to be consistently Jesus-like. So we recognize we are not going to continue affirming a culture that says all that matters, parents, is that you get your kids to church. We want to recognize that if in the process of getting them to church, you are devour, de devouring, belittling, and harming one another, that you are undoing any witness to Christ that they're going to get in the church. Where they need to see it is in your patience and kindness and ongoing repentance among each other. And so we recognize we have to value to be authentic. That priority of Christ ought to be experienced by the people that are closest to us. So we begin there in Jerusalem. Secondly, he says, go into Judea. So what Jesus is doing here is Jerusalem for the Jews would have been the center of the world and it would have been housed within Judea, which would have been the land of their ethnicity. But then he mentions Samaria, which is the land of their enemy, but we'll get to that in a minute. So then he goes to Judea. And so this is your sphere of concern. So as I seek to be faithful to Christ in my home, I recognize I live in a community of people, both here in the church in which I'm gathered, but we also exist in a larger community called Ardmore, and even a larger community if you go by school systems. And even, so maybe we should just say, we're called to the community in Carter County in Southern Oklahoma. And that gospel faithfulness is gonna look different than it might look in Bangladesh or New York City. So we want to be present in our context, in our community, to understand how we are being called to display the gospel and live the gospel in our sphere of concern. And again, this goes to how we treat one another and how we position ourselves to the greater community in our city and in our counties. We want to recognize we have a responsibility to ask the question, are we being faithful to serve Carter County in the way that the Spirit is calling us to do so? And if the answer is no, then we want to discern what our next step is in correcting that. So Jerusalem, your relational sphere of influence, Judea, your sphere of concern, uh oh but then Samaria. For the Jews, this, it probably would have been a toss-up between whether or not they hated the Samarians or the Romans the most. And this is who he brings up that is their commission to take the gospel. This means you are called to take Jesus to your sphere of the other. And by that, I mean the other is a softer term for it. It might be who you consider your enemy. This means that if you are called to a vision to make America great again by redoubling your faithfulness to your conservative ideology because that's how you feel God's calling you to serve, there's nothing wrong with that. But it means that when you are challenged with taking the gospel to Samaria, that might mean God wants you to go and love and understand the stories of those you consider your ideological opponents on the left. And it means if you are newly young and woke and full of optimism for the potential new direction of the land, and you just want to get away from the toxicity of all the conservative ideology that came before. If you're going to follow Jesus, that might mean that instead of going on a woke crusade, God might be calling you to serve 
love and understand those on the right who you consider the other, your ideological opponent. I don't know that I've ever seen a church consistently do this in my 50 years on earth. Wouldn't it be amazing to create space and to be part of a community that was willing to love beyond the boundaries of ethnicity and ideology? I think it would be beautiful. And the more diversity there is in my friendship circle, the more enriching my life becomes. And so we wrestle deeply with who's the other that you might be being called to learn how to love. And I am learning because I assure you, the illustrations in the original draft of this sermon were excruciatingly more offensive than the ones that I gave. Maybe for another day. But then finally, it's a vision for the ends of the earth, which means that we recognize as part of the body of Christ in our generation, we are called to practice the incarnation of the kingdom anywhere that darkness needs to be resisted and shalom needs to be pursued. That might be in Carter County. That might be in Honduras. That might be in Africa. That might be in a place that needs Bibles. And it might be in a place that just needs water wells. But we are beginning to open up and recognize we're part of a global community. And at some level, we have a call to steward our response to the needs of the global community. And we don't want to do that based on ideology or political activism. We want to do that by learning how to expand the incarnational presence of Jesus in God's kingdom anywhere where darkness is seeming to pervade. Because all it takes is the light, a little light, to begin to push back the boundaries of that darkness. And although I think it is important that we exercise and entertain something beyond war metaphor, and we talked about that last week or a couple of weeks ago, I still believe that we understand that there is a resistance, but the resistance isn't other human beings with different ideologies. The resistance is darkness that is pervasive and that is causing people to be toxic and oppressive and to harm, oppressive and to harm people. And we recognize we're called to pray about those places, but we're also called to go and be the presence of Christ. Now, I don't know what all that means at this point, but I do know it means that we need to start dreaming about that and praying about that. So our, our mission is to be true to Christ, to be kind to all people, and to be the body of Christ in our community in the, and beyond in the hopes that we will live into the vision that we are a community so rooted in God's love that we are renewing the understanding and expression of Christianity in our generation. In summary, what is our mission and vision? Be true, be kind, be Christ. That's what we're seeking our spiritual formation. That's the goal. That's what we want our activities and ministries to return to. Is it giving us the power to deepen our call and faithfulness to be true, to be kind, to be Christ? So in closing, how do we accomplish the mission? Well, you've heard it before. You'll hear it again. We all collectively agree we're going to give ourselves to the spiritual learning process of awareness, revelation, learning, or spiritual formation, reflecting the prayer of contemplation and action, practicing our values. So, would you all stand with me? And we are going to get ready to take communion together. Let me pause away from this, and then I'll give you a little prayer prompt in just a few minutes. That means we're going to begin from the back. We're going to make our way around this way, and this section will start from the back. With uh, a, There's a beautiful man there in the corner, I believe, and he will lead the way. You will follow that beautiful man and go back to your seat. Please hold on to the elements. And um, this section here will start. Is that Vod I see back there? He will be our leader. He will, bring, he will walk down to the front, go back to his seat, and you will follow. And I just, sorry, I can't see that part. You're, you're in a shadow over there. Uh, but whoever that is over there, they'll start and they'll come through this section. You'll go to your seat and hold on to the elements. In a few minutes, I'll come back up and we will take the elements together. Now, as you are receiving the elements, as you're coming to the table of fellowship with the living Christ, here are my questions. I would ask that you consider two responses this morning. Number one, what aspect of your relationship with Christ do you need to prioritize in this season? 
Maybe you understand the lordship, but you need to go more deeply into intimacy as a friend. Or maybe you understand that, but you don't fully, but you need to more deeply confront some of the darkness that's in your heart that you've let yet to let the blood of Christ cover you and deliver you from. Maybe you need to think about what it means to trust him as savior. I don't know where you may be, but you probably do. And if you don't, the spirit does. And so just ask the spirit's help. He'll, he'll, he'll lead you. And then leave here and have a conversation with somebody about it and to begin to develop actual action steps to prioritize this emphasis in the next season of your life. That was the easy one. The other one that I really implore you to seriously encounter, confront, and pray about is this. Who is your other that you are being called to love more intentionally? It will be offensive. It will be a challenge. It might be the thing that causes you to grow more as a human being than any other thing you've given your life to.